grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Our picture or our portrait of Jesus in our mind is one of a kind and caring man, someone who is, is gentle and meek. He invites the little children to come to him. He reaches out to the despised tax collector. He reconciles Peter, who had just denied him. He is the good shepherd, sent to seek and save the lost. And this is a beautiful and it is a biblical portrayal of who Jesus is. But our world sees this picture and think something else. They see someone who is weak. They see someone who is not tough enough for the real world, where, where little kids fight, where gunshots ring out in the darkness, where we are in, in one of the, we have had more armed conflicts in this period of history than any other. There's hostility between races, hostility between political parties, hostility within families, wars, uh, of wars against drugs, economic wars, cyber warfare. We are a world at war. But there is a war that is bigger than all of those. A war whose casualties number in the billions. A war that began with one catastrophic and horrendous world-changing event. This Lent, we, we take a, a closer look at this, this greater war. We watch as, it, watch as it, it comes down to its final showdown, and there is one person who stands out in this war. He is the promised warrior. You're here tonight because of Isaiah's prophecy. Hear his magnificent words. The Lord will march out like a champion. Like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. War clouds had long been looming. By the time Isaiah had written this, that was, that was 2,700 years ago. The world had already been waiting thousands of years for this warrior. From the moment that that we see Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden face off against Satan, our worst enemy, and lose. And we watch this, this perfect world plunge into sin, and along with it, death and hell. But God did not wait long to intervene. No, he, he comes to Satan himself after Adam and Eve lost that day, and he says to Satan that, he, he promises Satan he is going to send someone stronger than Adam and Eve, someone who is going to take the fight to Satan himself. Listen to God's promise of what is really future violence. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The conflict God predicted was not going to be pretty. It was not going to be sitting down and, and negotiating peace. No, it would be a bloody struggle between Satan and between the warrior who would come from Eve's family line. And that struggle would end with Satan's head crushed, Satan losing violently. But there was a long wait before that. Right? The time before, before the world was ready was a long way off. And in that time, the world went on populations grew, unbelief grew, and wickedness grew. Again and again, God reaches out to his people. He promises to his people. He strengthens his people for this coming warrior. And to their own detriment, they ignore him. You know, you know the reason why. Because that same corruption that was deep in them. That same defect is in all of us. The Bible calls it sin. And you cannot cut it out with a surgical knife. You cannot medicate it. You cannot burn it away with radiation. 
You cannot make peace with sin. And sin comes along with a, a couple allies of his own. Satan, a corrupt world, death. The only hope was to wipe them off the face of the map. Isaiah's words promise us that there are war clouds on the horizon. Lent is a, it's an excellent time for us to re-examine our own lives, to, to refresh and renew our zeal for repentance, to contemplate on Holy Week, because we know that that sin is still inside of us. We know that forces bigger than us are at work on us, forces that are trying to drag us down and damn us. We need someone bigger on our side to fight back. Because there is an enemy lined up before us. Some of them we can see, many of them we cannot. It's those clouds of war, they, they loom large over our own lives as well. We are weak. We are weary. There is a cry that begins deep in our own hearts. We need help. When, when the Apostle Paul honestly examined his own life, he, he put it in these words, What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to to death. Well, Isaiah has, has good news for the people of Judah. He has good news for the Apostle Paul, and he has good news for us. Here again, the promise, the Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal with a shout. He will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. The promised champion and warrior is coming. Isaiah makes it clear that God is a promise maker, and God is a God of hope. He, he promises a, a hero of the highest order, better than, than Batman or Superman, better than the strongest Avenger, greater than any hero in history is this promised hero. And Isaiah, Isaiah doesn't know when this hero will come, but he knows one thing for sure. He will come. But it would be another 700 years. 700 years after he gave that promise. That, that is a long time to wait. But this promise was meant to, to build up God's people's faith, to give them hope, to give them a vision of the coming victory. And that vision is a warrior, not just a a man with bulging muscles and lots of armor like Goliath, and, and certainly not a, a man cowering, kneeling in fear before his enemies. No, this is a warrior, a battle-hardened veteran, somebody who knows what he's doing in a fight. Who else was it that cast Satan out of heaven? Who else was it that single-handedly destroyed 185, 1,000 Assyrians on their way to destroy Jerusalem? Who is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, but the pre-incarnate Christ? This, this warrior has, has thousands of years of experience in battle and always as the victor. He stirs up his zeal. He pumps himself up for battle because he loves his people. And he is rightly angry when the evil one comes and tries to snatch them from his hand. He is someone so strong that he can willingly allow himself to be captured. And that's only after knocking those soldiers down with a couple words. He can willingly allow himself to be beaten and wounded, willingly allow himself to be hung on a cross. They could only do that to him because it was part of his strategy. And he hung there knowing that at any moment he could put a stop to the whole thing and blast them with the same power that he used to create the universe. Imagine the power that can say, let there be, and it brings the universe into existence. Those soldiers, those Jewish leaders, they could not kill him. Only he could willingly 
give up his life, and he only did it when the final enemy was utterly destroyed. There have been many famous warriors through history. Samurais and Spartans, Navy SEALs, U.S. Marines, but none of them, none of them compare to this warrior because, because he had something in them that all of them didn't. He didn't need body armor or, or advanced weapons. He was like us in every way except one. He had no sin. He was perfect and holy, pure and good. There was no deceit found in him, no sin found in him, and he came to be our substitute. He came for us. His whole life on this earth, he, he never said or, or did or thought anything sinful or evil or wicked, even as he was going to battle against his most dangerous foes, he did it with love as his motivation. We know who this warrior is. It's Jesus. And Isaiah has some very good news for us about him. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. This warrior will triumph. The promised warrior would come with a very unique battle cry. It didn't come at the beginning of the battle. It came right at, right at the very end. And it, it, it sent shivers down the spines of the enemies. It strengthened the hearts of his allies. You have heard this cry. You know this cry. You hear it tonight. You hear it, maybe not in these exact words, but you hear it every Sunday in this place. You hear it every time that you, you read God's gospel. It's this. Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. You recognize that for what it is, the sound of triumph. That is the sound of victory. Our, our Savior, warrior, brought an end to the conflict for our world. His work for you and for me was done. He won. The cry of triumph means that our sin and guilt is taken away. It means that our warrior clothes us with his victory. It means he covers our sinfulness with his righteousness. And Isaiah describes it like this. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Let there be no doubt tonight that, that Jesus Christ, the long-promised Savior warrior, came and won that war. And it wasn't without cost. It wasn't without pain and difficulty, even death. But the great news is Jesus conquered Satan, and he conquered sin, and he conquered even death itself. Because of this final battle, your steps are lighter. He has removed the wearying load that bears you down. Maybe, maybe you were tired, physically tired tonight when you came here, tired from a, a long day at work, a long day at, at school. A day home with the kids or a day home with your parents. Hassles of everyday life. But Jesus takes your heaviest burden. And he takes it on himself. And you have, you have already received refreshment from, from Jesus our Lord himself. He has solemnly promised you eternal life. Our hero warrior won the battle for the souls of all humanity. And our faith grasps on to that victory. Let, let our warrior, let Jesus Christ carry you through this Lenten season. And, and let us say with David of old, in peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Amen. 
The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.